All right, Shubham, I think you have a couple announcements. You had something to share with the class? Yeah, happy Diwali to everyone. I, how was your Diwali? It was good. It was good. But it's like uh, shifted, right? So the Diwali in India just happened. But then there's a US Diwali that's happening the next weekend because everyone has to do it twice. So, yeah. 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 So, I mean, that was nice. And my girlfriend visited me over the weekend and she was really interested in finding who's sending flowers. And who's coming to the lab. So that was an interesting conversation. Thanks to Andy and Jeff. That's and I might be playing a couple of shows next weekend. So I'll post you guys on that as well. Enjoy. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. We have a bunch to cover today. So we have a few things left over from the multi-version concurrency control part that we just started discussing last class. And I'm going to spend about like 20, 25 minutes on the MVCC. And there's some portions of this that, uh, depending on how much we make, through uh, today uh, might just relegate to stuff that you read on your own that won't be material for the exam. But I'll tell you when we hit that point, OK? <clears throat> and then what you want to do for the bulk of today is to get started on the recovery component, which is going to be split across uh, today and the next lecture. So if you remember, we were doing this multi-version concurrency control. So if I go back a couple slides, we were essentially doing things where as changes were happening to these objects, we were creating these uh, uh, chains of objects. So let's go to slide seven, where, there you go. So you saw how, in this case, A was being read and written a bunch of times. And what was happening in the database is we were keeping track of all those versions. We had a begin and end timestamp that basically told us what is that value, like A0 is valid from zero to one. From one to two, there's a different value, and two onwards, until sometime in the future, uh, there's a third value. So that's what multi-version does. It's going to create these different versions. And now we are, the readers are going to come in and find the right versions to work with. So multi-version is really, really popular. And in fact, uh, if you look at the systems that use it, just about every modern system will use multi-version concurrency control. OK? Now, We'll go and dig into the details of the other components that we need besides MVCC, right? We need a version management component, as we talked about. And with those versions, you can decide which version a reader is allowed to see based upon the timestamp. But we have a couple other things to discuss about the MVCC design considerations. So you're going to try and knock through most of this uh, today and see how far we can get, OK? And we'll, we are time bucketing about 25 minutes to cover these, this component. So we've talked about a whole bunch of concurrency control protocols, optimistic concurrency control, two-phase locking. So the natural question you may be asking is, how is this related to MVCC? So the best way to think about this is that MVCC is a mechanism that tells you how to maintain multiple versions. You still need a way to protect that mechanism with a concurrency control protocol. Multi-version basically creates a linked list of different versions. And at some point, there's some writer that's potentially writing and creating a new version, right? We saw in, in those examples. So obviously, we have to guard against things like two people trying to write and create new values. Like if you have a single linked list, only one person can add to that linked list uh, at a time, right? So only one person can be creating a new version at a time. And so we're going to have a concurrency control mechanism that we need in addition to the mechanism of keeping these versions. What this version stuff allows is that if I am a transaction that is reading something and my timestamp allows me to do that, I can read an older version and the readers can get past the writers. The writers don't block the readers if the readers have the right timestamp or they have the appropriate serialization, serialization order where they can pass through. Right? In two-phase locking, if I grab the right lock, there's only one version Everyone has to wait for it. A reader has to wait for it, right? And that's where we started to relax things with the intentional locking and things like that. But still, writers will block readers in the end case with two-phase locking. OK, so the concurrency control protocols you have, you can say, I can do a multi-version, which is a mechanism to allow what can be read at what time. You're keeping these different versions around. Can be combined with optimistic concurrency control, where you'll just run the three-phase protocol, except in your private workspaces where you'll keep these new versions, or two-phase locking where you'll use locking for objects that are getting created like the writers, not interfering with writers, 
or if a reader needs to read that uh, version that is being written because the timestamp says you need to be at a version that is being written, they'll have to wait for that. Okay, so locking can be used to do that. Uh, you can also do something very simple. We're not going to talk about that, but timestamp ordering where you have some mechanism for picking a timestamp and then use that to determine the serial order. Effectively, all that says you can come up with even simpler mechanisms where you say, I grab a timestamp, let's say at the beginning of the transaction, and I only read versions as of my timestamp, which is kind of what snapshot isolation does. So you can get that type of protocol. What we're going to concern ourselves with is these other topics now, right? There are five things we need to talk about in addition to MVCC as a mechanism that creates this version. The first one was concurrency control. They're going to start knocking these other things down. Like next thing we're going to look at is how is the storage for this version maintained, right? It's a singly linked list that we are maintaining. What are the different ways of organizing that? Just as we looked at what are different ways of organizing records in pages and, and uh, the, uh, structures like that. So let's get to the version storage. Now, we are creating these version chains. And these version chains have these begin and end timestamps that are associated with it. And there are different ways in which we could create these version chains. As we'll see, for all of the remainder topics that we have for MVCC, for each of those mechanisms, the, uh, each of these addition things that we need to consider for MVCC, we'll see there are some number of options. There'll be three, four, five options, and then each one of them will have their pros and cons. So the first question we are going to look at with version storage is, how do we store these versions? Guess what? There are three ways to do it. Both are, all of them have their pros and cons and some historical context. The first one is append-only storage, where I'm going to create the chains, kind of like what we've been seeing in the diagram so far, where in the same table where the record is, you're going to create the version, uh, version uh, com way, uh, 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 components of those records. Time travel, which is used by systems that didn't have MVCC, but then realize that, wow, with MVCC, you can get a lot more concurrency, especially for the readers. So they slapped on a mechanism to keep versions by saying, I'll just create a second copy of the table where all my versions are maintained. And we'll see that in a little bit. The preferred way is delta storage. So if you're building an MVC system from scratch, that's kind of what you will use. So <clears throat> what's the simplest? It's kind of what our diagrams have been. So here I've got two records, A and B. And the entire records, even though only one value is being shown, like uh, 111 in the first one. Think of it as being the entire record. That's what's getting stored in the table. And as you create new versions, you will create that essentially as a new record in that same table, in that same physical table or the physical file that is keeping track of all the records in there. Right? Because the new record has the same schema. All of them now have this additional, what is shown as a pointer, but that pointer is like that big and end timestamp and bunch of other information that's associated with it. So you'll just create the new version and then you'll maintain the pointers internally, right? So you can think of it as your slotted page organization being used to create a file. And in that file, you have record IDs. So A0 is a record ID, A1 is a different record ID, but there's this extra field of pointer that chains them together and allows you to maintain your singly linked list, right? Pretty straightforward, easy to implement, if you start with this slotted page organization and you had extra fields that you designed in the first place with this begin and timestamp to keep track of all these pointers. There is an interesting question with the version chain is a singly linked list. The question is, where does a new version sit? Is it at the end of the chain or is it at the beginning of the chain? And you could decide the implementation and their pros and cons to that. From a perspective of what is easy to implement, it's very easy to implement something that goes from oldest to the newest. Because you just create a new record as we were just doing up over here, a new value, new a value needs to be created, a new tuple, you just create it at the end and then uh, connect everything back to it like that. So oldest to newest is the easiest and that's what will get used as the mechanism in this last uh, project assignment that you have in BusTub. Uh, but obviously, the downside of that is if I have to find the latest version, I have to traverse the chain. And notice these chains may actually be spread across multiple pages. So you may have to go through multiple pages to go get a record ID that you're interested in. Okay? All right? The other way is newest to oldest, but that's more difficult to implement. You know, it's kind of logically, you have to create the new record, move everything uh, around to get that 
uh, the change to work in the reverse direction. And you'll see there's a subtle point associated with both of these as to how does an index refer to the record ID, right? So if I create a three version uh, 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 chain for the record A, as we were, saw in the slides a little while back, it's like, I have an index, which one does it point to? And the implications of this oldest to newest and newest to oldest will become a little bit more apparent as we go through some of that, okay? But there are two ways. That's all we need to know of organizing this list. And it can go from one uh, forward to backward or the other way around. The, all the, like, the later nodes like, point to the first one? Yeah, so are you, uh, in the newest to oldest, uh, the question is, are you, how are you updating that? So imagine, uh, this is, you can just think of it as a singly linked list. And so here is a singly linked list maintained in append only storage going from oldest to newest. If it's the other way around, you'll just have to flip the pointers around. So you, there's more pointer management stuff that you'll end up having to do. You create a new record, that becomes the head. And what does it mean to be at the head? It means that's what someone else refers to if they're coming from outside. So it'll become clear in a second as we get to the index part, right? The only thing you need to know is that, yeah, I can, when I get to a record from somewhere else, most often from an index, do I land on the oldest or the newest? And depending on the scheme, to find my newest record, I have to chase down the chain. If it's newest to oldest, if I'm only looking for new stuff, which is often the most uh, common pattern, I'll find it right away. I don't have to access a chain. And these chains can span across pages, so it can be very expensive to chase this chain down. OK? All right. Second type of storage is time travel. And this is systems that globbed in an MVCC system when they didn't have one before will use something like that, which requires the least disruptive change to your existing storage structure. So here, if I have a record and I create a new record, A2, it will get put in the main table. And then I've got a time travel table. And in that time travel table, I'll put the old values. And the old values keep, will keep getting accumulated in that second table. So now if I need, if I'm a reader and I'm only allowed to read A2, I will start from the main table, go down to a second table, which is a different file. So obviously that's more expensive that way. You won't ever get locality uh, to chase down that. You're crossing table boundaries, but it doesn't disrupt the main table, which just has a single copy, the most recent copy, and uh, uh, as you can see over here. Okay, and that most recent copy may not be the one that eventually gets committed, we'll start talking about the recovery protocols a little bit. But it's the most recent copy in the chain that exists at that point in time. If you use time travel storage, do you have to do newest to oldest? Uh, if you do time travel storage, it implicitly gives you newest to oldest. Yes, that's correct. That's a good observation. That's correct. And basically, it's done, as you can imagine, if you had a 30-year-old database system and all of a sudden MBCC is the way you get more concurrency, especially for the readers. This is the least disruptive change you would make to your system. Okay? Because your indices can keep pointing to the latest copy in the main table. All right? And the record ID hasn't changed. It still is in the same slot in the same page. Why is it implicitly uh, newest to oldest? Like, I guess the head was sort of in the main table. Version. The newest is there. Yeah. So, yeah. And so here in this diagram, as you can see, it's a little weird. A2 is the oldest, which is pointing to A1, which is, uh, which is not necessarily the, uh, old, the newest. But, and you can flip it around and switch it around in a different way. So it's, it can be a hybrid between newest to oldest uh, and oldest to newest. But the newest copy is always going to be in the main table through which you start the access. And that's the main point. A2 is the newest one. But you can imagine a weird scheme in which A2 is in the main table, but that points to something else that, you know, if the chain will become A1, A2, A3, and A3 is in the main table, you could say, yeah, A3 points to A1 from the main table to the time travel table. You can come up with schemes like that to be not purely newest to all this, but if you had to say which one, it sort of makes more sense. It's like the main table has the newest stuff, right? Which is where you're starting your access from. So you can do all kinds of fiber. And with all of this stuff, I'm going to speed through it a little bit. You can even find like 50 different schemes. And there's a full-fledged paper, which I'll leave you with, because we could spend like four weeks just talking about MVCC. All right, so master version in this case is going to be get written in place. All right, so now let's go on. And so here, that's just showing that the master is getting written. The preferred way is this delta storage. So far, all of this storage, if I made change to a single column, I was actually making a full copy of the record. And the record may have hundreds of columns. So if I just changed one, I'm doing everything 
uh, I'm making a large amount of copy where the diff is really small. So delta storage is essentially that keyword diff. And I'll only take the value, the column that I'm changing, which could be more than one in a given record, depending upon what that update query is. And I'm going to store in delta storage uh, that the value that has changed and then keep track of that through, uh, through a pointer, right? So essentially the big difference between the delta storage and the other methods is here, you just keep track of just the value that has changed. And now, this can get complicated too because there could be multiple values in a column that has changed. But as you can imagine, you can generalize that stuff to only keeping track of the change that you've made. So uh, I noticed that uh, whether you use delta storage or time travel, you always keep a copy of the most update value in the, uh, in the other yeah. Uh, do you add it when you update the main table, or do you add it? Uh, do you add it like after you update the main table? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're asking, uh, when do I make a change in the main table versus the delta storage table? Yeah. So again, there's going to be a bunch of details, but most of the time, what you're going to do is you're going to take the copy, put it over there, then update the value in there. You'll move the old one stuff out to the where is your backup storage or where is the chain storage before you make that? Because you have to remember that and you have to make that copy before. Because what happens if there's a crash between you making those changes, if both the values are the same, they'll have the same timestamp, you can go clean some of that stuff if you need it to. Uh, if A2 in the main table doesn't get updated to A3, then theoretically there wouldn't be a Yeah, entry. yeah. Yeah, and so you're getting into a little bit of this recovery protocols and the fact that sometimes you may want to undo some change because something aborted. Absolutely, all of that will happen with uh, versioning too. And we'll get to what we'll do. Like literally what we'll do is before we go and along with the changes that we make, we'll also write what we are going to talk about next, which is log records to maintain the change. And then depending upon how you're using those log records, you could do one of different schemes. But we'll record stuff to undo things. So all you need to know now is yeah, bad things can happen while you're making these changes. That's the recovery stuff we'll start talking about, where we'll keep track of logs to, to uh, be able to back ourselves out of some unsafe state if we started to make this change and things crashed in the middle. Or the transaction aborted, right? Yeah, good question. All right, so delta storage is that transactions can recreate. In all of these things, transactions can recreate old values. In the tuple-based schemes, they just go to the tuple and they get the whole thing. Here you can create old versions by applying the delta in the reverse order because it's creating, it's keeping track of the delta, right? Even though it's not quite shown, value is being changed, it, it'll say uh, it might have some sort of a delta associated with it. And we'll talk about that from the logging perspective too, but that notion of delta is effectively the same. Now, the minute you have versions, you also need to do garbage collection. And because as you keep building the version chains, lots of updates, let's say, happen to a record. At some point, the version chains will build up. New readers are coming in. They have a new timestamp. No one's reading. No reader has a timestamp that was really, really old. So we need to clean up those versions. Okay. And so uh, there are, again, multiple ways in which you can go do this. And you have to look for these expired versions. And then you have to decide when it is safe to go and reclaim that. Now, when it is safe to do this expired version is typically you're going to say, uh, I have a, some sort of transaction number or timestamp that I'm assigning to transactions. And I kind of know what's the oldest transaction that is running in the system. Anything older than that, I don't need. So you have a way to go and figure out what portion of the tail of this version chain you can throw away. Okay. Now, the question is, when you have this type of garbage collection that you need, now you've determined what you can throw away. When do you go about doing that? Again, there are two approaches. You can do it at a tuple level where you're going through the chains. And I'm just going to assume everything is at a tuple level. The same thing will generalize if it's not. And there are two methods for the tuple level. Background vacuuming, where a background thread does this. Cooperative cleaning is kind of where you bust your own tables, right? So when you see something wrong, you go fix it. That's the second approach. And then there's something to do at the transaction level. So let's go through each of those techniques. The tuple level GC is pretty straightforward. I've got some background vacuuming thread that starts up every once in a while. It goes and looks through all the place where the versions are, right? Depending on the scheme, it's going to be in a different place. And then it's going to say, I know what the latest transactions are. So as these things are getting changed, you end up with a place where you say, at this point, I can determine that A1, the 100 
uh, anything with a version of 100 is no longer needed because I know all the transactions that are in the system. No one needs a value older than 100. And I can basically go and start to vacuum those out and remove that. Now, remember, these version chains could be long. They could be spread across different pages and things like that. So this vacuuming process can be pretty expensive. And it's making extensive changes to that entire database, uh, which you know, obviously is not just one file, one table, but all the tables could have had this type of version management that is needed. One optimization you could do instead of saying, I'm always going to scan all the files from start to the end, from the first page to the last page. Every time some update happens to a page, you'll keep track of a simple metadata, which might have one bit per page that marks the page as dirty. So you've got a billion pages in your database and only 1,000 of them were touched. The vacuum process doesn't need to go and read the billion pages to determine have you been touched, right? Is there a version tail in your page that I need to clean up? It'll just go and look at the pages that are the ones that need this cleanup and only go and change those. Okay, so that's an obvious optimization you'd build, especially if you're doing this on a large scale. Cooperative cleaning is, you know, if you don't, if you go to a sit-down restaurant, they'll bring all the uh, uh, food for you and take away the plates from you. Uh, but if you go to a place where you're busing it yourself, you'll go to the counter, pick up your food, and uh, clean up your tray. It's kind of like that. Uh, with cooperative cleaning, as you do the work, the workers, as they do their work, will identify if they see something that needs to be cleaned up, and they will do the cleanup themselves. And sometimes it's like, when do you do the cleanup while you're doing the work or after transaction commits? Those are other choices that we can make. We'll ignore those comments. But the difference is that you don't have a separate background thread that's doing that. You basically do a pay it forward style of work where imagine I am a transaction that wants to get a value A. I use an index to get to that. That index now gets me to the A record. But that A record, imagine the chaining technique that we use is oldest to newest. So it brings me to the head of the oldest. I know what my timestamp is, right? So I know I don't need that. I need to keep chasing it down till I get to the one that I should be reading. But as I do that, since I'm already chasing down the version chain, I'm bringing the pages into disk if I need to. Might as well go and help uh, clean up till I get to the, uh, the value, the record that I need to read, which may, by the way, not be at the end of the chain, right? Because it may be, depending on what my transaction number is, I, uh, I should be reading that value A2. And there may be newer versions behind it. But whenever I need to stop, I'll stop and clean up stuff before me. I think there's also situations where, uh, let's say you have some, uh, some chain that's really long that you never access. Yes. You might just, that, that thing just might never be cleaned up. Yeah, so it can even happen that if I've got a chain that is really long and that uh, record is no longer accessed. It was very hot in 2020 and a billion, uh, you know, Taylor Swift ticket counter. And the Taylor Swift ticket counter for a venue was really popular and had a billion version chains, million entries built up in the version chain. Now she has a new uh, venue and no one's going and cleaning that up and that could happen. You could ask a more philosophical question is why did the chains build up if everyone is cleaning up on the fly, but we'll defer that. Sometimes they may be deferring that. I thought that's what you're going to ask, but that, that, can, that can happen. Okay. And again, as I said, there are like so many million ways of combining these things in different ways that all you need to know is that there are these different schemes to do it. And there are exclusive, exquisite, large number of ways in which you could combine all of this. But I do want to get to the indexing part, which is important. But before we do that, remember, Two slides ago, we said garbage collection, tuple level, and transaction level, right? So we finished the tuple level stuff. Now let's go to the transaction level stuff. The transaction level stuff is very uh, is different. Every transaction is going to keep track of all the stuff that it is doing, including things that it is now outdating because it created new versions. A transaction knows, right, when it has added something to the version change. So in this approach, as a transaction proceeds, it's doing an update, uh, and then the second operation comes in, it's creating these old versions. The basic thing is when a transaction is done, it knows I created two versions, one for record A, one for record B. And at that point, a vacuum process can be handed over those versions. And now that can determine, saying my uh, oldest version I need is 10 onwards, if all of these are less than 10, I can go clean it up, right? So the vacuum process doesn't have to go through each and every page, even with that dirty page marker to determine where these versions are. Transactions just hand it over to you 
So the and those are the things that need to get cleaned up. Okay, so just a different way of doing that uh, and clearing up the versions. Now this I want us to spend a little bit of time on. Okay, and the rest of this uh, 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 material I'll just basically leave it in slides and let you uh, worry about it. In other words, index management is stuff up to uh, all of this material material for exam questions. But the last part I'm going to skim over and you don't need to worry about. So pay attention now. All right. So indices point to object IDs, to record IDs, right? Imagine you have a slotted page organization. It's going to say page number and the slot number. Now, if I've got a primary key index and I could be updating the primary key and I'm making changes to that, I now need to figure out how I'm going to keep track of that version chain and the version chain stuff we can keep track of with techniques we talked about, but now I have to go and update that primary key. Now it gets very tricky. So often what happens when you're doing this versioning type of mechanism for primary key updates, you'll basically treat it like a delete followed by an insert. It makes the semantics clean and you won't have that version chain develop, right? Because you delete, everything's gone and do an insert, okay? The problem becomes more interesting with secondary keys because they are more complicated, right? In some sense, the primary key controls the record, right? Because you're accessing the record. The record ID and the primary key in many ways are analogous. So you can do these things like insert delete, but for the secondary keys, you can't do that, right? There's a secondary key. And there's a very famous incident that happened at Uber a few years ago where they used to be on MySQL that had a good way of doing secondary indices. And Postgres doesn't have a good way. So it is multi-version. Both of them are multi-version. And as a result, if you have lots of updates happening in your system, the performance will go down quite poorly unless you have the good way of doing secondary indices. So we'll talk about the good and the bad way. And so Uber went back and changed it again to Postgres from Postgres to MySQL because they realized that this was a problem. So you know they hadn't taken this class. Uh, so Secondary indices are going to point to logical pointers, and Heron's thumb is going to be the problem. It's like those are, think of it as surrogate pointers. They can't control the object. They can't willy-nilly do this delete followed by an insert uh, technique. And there are two approaches. One is a logical pointer and a physical pointer. So just look at it with a diagram. I've got a version chain, A4 to A1. And if I have uh, appended stuff to it, and let's assume this is newest to oldest. Okay, and same things will apply for other schemes, but newest to all this is the is the interesting one. I say get this value a from this primary key, and I will go. I'll get the record ID, right? That's what the index is going to have the record ID, and I'll go find the record a four, which is the fourth version of the record a, but it's a physical record that I'm going to get. I'm going to get a physical record ID, and I can locate a four. So far, everything is good, no problem, right? And now you can see if the primary key is getting updated. If I delete and insert it, then I don't have to worry about a bunch of this. The secondary indices, however, if I say get something which has to get to this record A, the record ID is going to point to A4, and that's OK, except I could have multiple secondary indices on the record A. You know, It has five columns. I could have built a secondary index on each of those five columns. Now, each of these secondary indices is going to point to that first record for older, the newest version in this version chain. Again, so far, everything is good. Nothing, nothing bad has happened so far. Now you start to get into some uh, issues, which is if I have to go and update this value and create a new version A5, what's going to happen? I'll have to update A5. I'll get a new record in a page, fix the version chain using these version management schemes that we discussed, maybe of Delta storage. Now, I have to go and update each of the secondary indices to have the record IDs point to the new A5, which is a lot of updates. So one update to the record will cause every secondary index to be updated. Right? So you can see how this starts to become a huge problem. right? What would be the way to avoid it? I already showed you. Yeah, good, good, good. But you're paying attention. That's great. See, in computer science, indirection is a very powerful technique. You know, 50% of problems can be solved with indirection, right? Uh, so instead of secondary indices pointing to the record IDs, what you would do is you would say, because the primary key is kind of like a record ID, 
the secondary index will say, I'm just going to point to the primary key, which does mean that when I'm accessing a record through the secondary key, I have to go to the primary key and then get the record ID, one extra hop. But if it's, if it's hot, then probably the primary key index is already in the buffer pool, so it's not too bad. But what that gives me is that now if I change a record, all I do is make the changes in the primary index, the secondary index stuff doesn't have to change. So a single update to a single column, think about in Uber's case, if they changed the rate for uh, uh, taxi service, and that's changing all the time, and that's one field that was changed in a record, now all the indices have to change, that just causes the massive problem, and hence that huge performance problem, okay? There's another way to do the indirection, which is to say, what if we had a global structure that converted tuple ID to the to some sort of an address and everyone went through that into the primary key. You could do that, but no one does that because the primary key uh, index is essentially that. There have been proposals that talk about doing that because, hey, does this mean if I have to use this more fancy scheme, which is better for performance with the uh, secondary key indices, that I must have a primary key index? The answer is yes. The primary key index is typically always built because that's how the system enforces primary key constraint. So you can uh, assume, especially in that environment, you have that. So that scheme is basically the preferred scheme to do it. Okay. So if you're doing versioning, which just about every system does, you have to be careful as to what your secondary indices point to. All right. Okay. Question. Yeah. Yeah. How does all of this come into play? This, like, this only works if you have to append only this. Yeah, so this works well, well when you have newest to oldest. So if my newest comes in an A5, it's got a new record ID, right? So in this case, it'll have a new record ID that I need to point to. You could have said, if I had oldest to newest, I wouldn't have this problem. Which... Okay. This is the primary key point. Does it point towards the uh, table index? Yeah, so it depends on the scheme. If I have newest to oldest, every index is going to point to the newest head of the link. Okay? And so he said, look for primary key updates. We are going to assume that it's delete followed by an insert. So ignore that case, right? We swept it away by a different type of implementation. So in this case, now I've got uh, newest to oldest, and the version chain has built up. A4 is the newest, which is being referred to by all the indices. Right, so now if I add, let's say, a new A5 version, then all the secondary indices have to point to A5 because you know they have to see the whole version chain to traverse through it. But in the, suppose the time travel version where it's always removed in the same position. In the same position. Yeah. Right. Oh, you're saying in the time travel where I had my, you're talking about the scheme number two where the main table had it, yep. Yeah, 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 that's right. So in that scheme, and you're exactly right. In the scheme where we had a separate time travel table, that was the lowest lift for someone to go and get MVCC. There they're pointing to that main table. So the record ID hasn't moved. It's the same page ID, slot ID, and this problem is, is, is simpler over there. Absolutely. But as I said, look, there are all kinds of schemes that will go through that. I don't want to spend an infinite amount of time in looking through all the combinations. I will leave you with a paper that talks about a lot of these combinations. Okay, and then what are the different pros and cons? But I'll take that final question before we move on. Wait, so, so you said for time travel, you don't need it. But for delta, you still need it. Yeah, and you know, again, it'll get into some other nuances. Even for time travel, you can think about there's a version chain that's maintained. But the head, if it remains over there in the page ID and the record ID and it's updated in place, then this problem doesn't happen if you have update in place. And that's the head of that uh, uh, table. So update in place for Delta service. You can come up with all kinds of schemes to avoid this problem. But most systems will do some sort of version management that may end up having this problem. Just need you to be aware that if your record IDs are moving around, then if you're using any sort of version management scheme, then you're going to run into trouble like this. Okay. Okay, good. The rest of it from here onwards, slide 27 onwards, it's not going to be material for the exam. So I'm just going to skim through it really fast. Uh, because MVCC looks like the keys can be duplicate, it turns out that even the primary keys, if I'm using the scheme in which I'm updating a primary key and I have versions, it'll kind of look like if you think about the implementation of B tree, 
for typically for a primary key, you would have implemented to say, I can never have a duplicate key. But in some sense, the keys can have, you may need duplicates for a little bit of time. Okay, so again, as I said, I'm not going to go into the details for it, but let you look through that. And you can read the chapter in the book that talks about that. But you have to worry about uh, those components. There's also the issue of deletes. Again, I'll let you read that by yourself. But there are different ways to implement the delete function by keeping a delete flag or a tombstone flag. This has to do with I've got a version chain. And if I delete it, uh, uh, there are different ways of deleting that. And sometimes it's, uh, it's uh, better to just mark a record as being deleted. And then eventually it can get uh, cleaned up. Or you can have a tombstone-based uh, approach to basically clean up this version with, in a, in a two-step process. So again, the details for this, not material for the exam. But I uh, encourage you to read the textbook. But up to here, the key problem I do want you to know, and we may ask you questions about that, OK? Uh, last piece over here, just for those of you who have more curiosity, is the, there's an explosion in the combinations that you can achieve with all of these different ways. What's my garbage collection? What's my index doing? Is it pointing to a physical uh, record ID, or is it pointing to a logical record ID that I can create in one of many different ways? Uh, including pointing to the primary index. Uh, what's the protocol I use to protect the right objects, right? As versions are getting created, I still need to protect that new versions getting created. And you can do two-phase locking or optimistic concurrency control. Postgres uses some uh, a combination as 2PL and also a time order protocol. So a lot of these things are feasible as combination. And if you're curious about the types of things that are feasible, there are two papers that you may want to read at. One is Andy had a beautiful paper on in-memory MVCC. So even a smaller version than on-disk-based MVCC, which is even more choices for you. But even in that, the explosion in number of choices is huge. And he does an excellent job, he and his students, of cataloging the different mechanisms, giving them proper names and categories. It's a beautiful paper to read if you're interested in that. And in-memory MVCC is super interesting because a lot of transactional databases fit in memory. Because today you can get a four terabyte server and very few transactional databases need a lot more than eight or 10 of those to really uh, do all of their workload, including with replication and a little bit of fault tolerance. Uh, there's another paper, if you wanted to go into a depth of one specific protocol, I'd recommend the Hackathon uh, paper, which is very clean. Uh, it was developed by these guys at Microsoft, including Paul Larson, who's a giant in that field. He's since retired. Uh, but one of my students uh, worked on this. It's a very clean protocol, as simple as uh, Paul could make it with help from others. Uh, and it also has an interesting aspect because they had SQL Server, which is an on-disk stuff, and they wanted to add this MVCC in-memory stuff, and there are very interesting ways in which they could cleanly put that together. So Hackathon is the in-memory MVCC, which can be uh, put as an extension to SQL Server, which is an on-disk system. So very clever engineering and a very clean protocol for the in-memory case. So those of you who have been asking a million questions, I love that. Uh, please go take a look at that. These papers won't be covered in the graduate database class, but if you're interested, stop by my office hours, and I'd be happy to walk you to the paper and take questions. Okay? And I'm sure Andy would too. All right. You guys are doing a good job of making sure the exam is not going to have a lot of material. So. Great, but uh, let's keep moving. All right, and let me just make sure sharing is still working. Great. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about logging uh, next. And it's part of a two-piece component. We'll figure out how to log things so that we can make changes, but if something crashes, like some of the questions that were asked, it's like, what happens if I'm adjusting this chain, but I haven't finished fixing the chain, or I fixed the chain and something bad happens, type stuff like that. Though largely today, we are only going to focus on single version protocol, but the concepts will apply in the other cases, okay? And again, it's like, if I can, if we can get you the single version foundational pieces in there, you'll be able to read papers by yourself and figure things out. I was just telling, uh, a couple of students last week and earlier today too, is that the best we can do as teachers is to teach you how to learn things. So hopefully we can get the foundation material that you need. And this is a never ending game of how you can invent better and better techniques. But before that, a couple announcements. 
Project three is due really soon. There's special office hours on Saturday, uh, 3 to 5 p.m. in GSC 4303. If you still need that help, some of you are already done, congratulations. But for those of you who need help, uh, 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 that's available. Project four is on concurrency control. It's going to be out today. And uh, that's due December 10th. So you have a little bit of time for it, but there's a bunch in there. So you know, don't wait again to the last minute for going through that. And the write-up, unfortunately, is going to be a little bit uh, 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 detailed because you're getting into concurrency control, like optimization, it's hard. The optimization piece that you did was very light, but here we're gonna have to get you into uh, MBCC and stuff like that. So buckle up, it's gonna be fun, but you're gonna get to do uh, uh, some interesting things with MVCC and O2N type of version chains. A bunch of database talks. There are three more left in this, and I think there may be a, uh, I think this is only the last three in the semester. Uh, I strongly recommend not missing, uh, especially the Alibaba talk, because they're doing something at a massive scale, and uh, it'll be super interesting to see what they talk about. The PG Vector stuff and Chroma is coming after that. All right, so let's get to recovery protocols today. Really fun stuff. So you remember we had the acid components. So far, we've only done I, which is the isolation stuff. Okay, we still have A and D to cover. And C, as we talked about, is consistency based upon you know, database as integrity constraints and other forms of defining what semantics need to be enforced, and we will enforce that. So let's start getting into the recovery component, which is the last missing piece to complete the asset components. Okay. So we're going to want transactions to be all or nothing, and we want to A part, and we need transactions to be durable. So if a transaction is declared committed, even after that, if the system crashes, the changes are recorded in the state of the database. So we'll start simple with uh, motivation, simple transaction, reading, writing stuff. And now we have a buffer pool, which obviously database systems have, but now we're going to make it explicit in our diagrams because it's because of the buffer pool that we're going to have to worry about a lot of things. So we bring in a page. The page has a lot of stuff, a lot of records, a lot of columns in each record. But the uh, one of them is that value A that we are trying to write, the column A. And we'll go bring that in. And then when we write it, we will go and update that in the buffer pool. Okay, That's what we do, right? The updates happen in the buffer pool. Now, at the time that we get to do a commit, what do we do? To get durability, we could insist on taking any change that has been made and push it out to disk. And if we do that, we will get durability, but it will be very slow. But let's say we have other protocols that don't require us to flush everything to disk at commit time, because this transaction could have touched a billion records and a billion pages. You don't want to flush a billion pages. But what happens if the power goes out or someone zaps the memory? Okay, And if it zaps the memory, We've committed the transaction, but the change was only in the buffer pool and we've lost it, right? So we don't have a durable transaction anymore. That was Andy's picture of saying a bad guy comes and zaps it. So, uh, all right. So that's what crash recovery is all about. And we have to go and get this atomicity and durability components. And we're going to do this in two parts. So there are two lectures. Today, we'll talk about the first part is what actions do we need to take during regular transaction processing to create stuff that we need to recover from. The second part, which is once you have kept stuff that you need to uh, keep around, how do you recover? That's the uh, second lecture on Wednesday. So today, what do we need to do? So here are the six things that we need to worry about. First, we'll talk about why failures happen. Then we'll talk about buffer pool policies because that is at the heart of why we need to do these fancy new things. And then we'll talk about two different mechanisms, shadow paging and write ahead logging as a way of keeping track of changes that we make. And I'll tell you, shadow paging is a bad idea. It's what old system used to use. It has all kinds of issues. I will only touch upon it and then move to write ahead logging, which is the main part that we need. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the logging schemes. What do you put in these logs and then checkpoint it? So first is we're going to have to concern ourselves with these different storage types. And We've talked about this. I'm going to go to the next slide and come back to it. You remember this slide on the right that we had, which is which talked about data is in different places. And there's a reason why we have processor caches and DRAM and SSDs and slow SSDs and fast SSDs, because as you go down this hierarchy, you get more capacity, but it's also slower. 
And you don't want to have all the data be in the lowest capacity, let's say SSD or a spinning disk. If you didn't have a buffer pool, the database system would be very slow. So you want to use the highest level, which is going to be volatile storage, which is DRAM, because that's where you want to make all of your changes. That's fast, uh, but it's volatile. The non-volatile storage, the SSD layer, is where you want to make sure you make put your changes in there so that if the bad guy comes in and zaps the DRAM, the volatile storage, you still can provide this durability property that you're that you have to guarantee. Okay. Now there's a third type of storage described in the textbook, which is real, called stable storage. And that basically is something that survives all possible failure scenarios. Such a theoretical storage doesn't exist, but you can come close by making replicas of everything that you do. You can replicate the disk and synchronize the replicas using distributed transaction protocols. We'll talk about that in the last three lectures of the class briefly. Okay, So stable storage, we won't uh, touch at all today. So we want dirty pages to sit. Right now, we'll just concern ourselves with the two-tier scenario for the remainder of today's lecture and tomorrow, which is buffer pool in DRAM. And that gets spilled out to some stable storage like SSD or disk, which can survive a power failure. OK? So let's begin. Why do transactions fail? There are multiple reasons. First, transactions can fail because there are logical errors in the transaction. I updated a record, and oops, the integrity constraint failed, or a constraint on the database failed, the C part. So now I need to abort this transaction. Okay, or it could be the transaction failed because everything that it's doing is fine, but it's deadlocking with another transaction. And sorry, but you got picked as a transaction that needs to be killed. So transactions can fail for a variety of reasons. And that will all get part of the atomicity and durability that we are doing because a transaction that has failed may have already started to make some changes. We'll have to undo all of those changes. There can also be system failures, such as Surprise, surprise, software sometimes have bugs. Operating systems sometimes has bugs. Right? So your system could crash for a software failure, and part of the work may have been done, transaction has not committed, or it has committed, but changes were in buffer pool, and we still need to make sure the right thing happens. There could be hardware failures, like in the early days of data centers, there used to be a failure that uh, the meta guys, then called Facebook, had written papers about saying, the DRAMs that were put on the servers because all of them were so close by, and they hadn't really figured it out as to what happens at that scale, not just them, but everyone, the DRAM chips would come off. And one of the common failures was after a little while, even though everything was fine, the DRAM chips would just come off their slots. Now they glue it most of the time. You don't want that to happen. Uh, so hardware could fail for a variety of reasons. It could be something like that, or it could be the part actually failed, uh, the system crashes, all kinds of things that happen. One thing we're going to assume today is that the non-volatile storage, the SSD or the disk, does come back and has the contents because we don't have this ideal storage with the replication stuff. So just reiterating that component. The storage media could fail uh, where you know you thought you wrote a page to disk, but it actually didn't get written. The disk driver came back and said, yeah, it's written, but the bits got corrupted on that. We've talked about bit rotting and other kinds of things. You will need other types of mechanisms with the replication to deal with that. And again, we won't cover that. We will assume that something else takes care of that. We'll concern ourselves with just this two-tier stuff that we talked about, okay? Where the primary storage is in this non-volatile DRAM storage, and the main storage is in this volatile storage. Now, what we need to do as a database system is to make sure committed transactions changes make it to the stable storage, and no partial changes are left around. Even if they made it to durable storage, we can unwind ourselves from that. We need two key mechanisms to do this. One is called undo, which is, whoops, I put something into stable storage, into the non-volatile storage that was changes made by a transaction that got aborted because it was a transaction failure or one of these other failures we talked about. And now I need to undo that. And the other one is redo, which is, oh, the committed transaction made changes that were just in the buffer pool, but the transaction is committed. We told the world that the transaction has committed, but now, we need to uh, go and reapply those changes. So those are the two mechanisms that we need to build into our system. So another example, you start with a buffer pool, and you read of A. You get the page, which has a bunch of things in it, including the A value. You write it. You have a new value, 
then stuff happens where B is changed by a different transaction on the same page as where A is that was updated by transaction T1. So now two transactions have made changes to the same page. And remember, we move stuff from the buffer pool to the disk in pages, right? So now this page has two different things from two different transactions. T2 commits, what do we do at this point? If we said we can flush that page to disk to ensure that T2's changes are durable, uh, we will also carry along with us A's changes and A's outcome is uh, T1's outcome to A is not yet known. We don't know what's going to happen because if we flush all of that to disk, ultimately T2 could abort and we need to go unwind the changes that made it to disk. Okay, So there'll be all kinds of schemes you can come up with. We'll categorize this into a nice quad chart shortly, but basically saying because things are on the same page and the buffer pool can move things around in pages, in a given page might be changes for multiple transactions in different states. And we have to make everything work with that scenario. Okay? All right? So if T2 needs to be rolled back, I needed to know that the previous value was not A3. Now that may be sitting in the version chain if that's the storage uh, technique that I'm using, but I have to go chase it down and I have to go figure it out. Okay? I still have to keep track of the changes that I made, which is the logging stuff, which works with all of these techniques that we've discussed before. It's orthogonal to all of that. Okay, But as I said, today we'll just concern ourselves with a single version uh, component of this. You can do all kinds of a little bit more interesting thing with multi-version, but let's get the single version foundation in first. All right? Okay. The other complication arises from the buffer pools replacement policy. So you guys implemented the LRU2 policy when you wrote the buffer pool, and that gave a lot of freedom to the buffer manager, simple piece of code that can decide, I'll keep track of the recency of a page based on this LRU2 counters, and I'll decide when to kick something out, when an eviction needs to happen. The only thing we said is that if a page is pinned, someone's actually using it, can't kick it out, but if a page is unpinned, it could be dirty and I can kick it out. So the buffer pool, to get maximum performance, maximum use, of the space, it's a cache, of that caching if, uh, efficiency is saying, I'm allowed to kick things out even if there are dirty changes, if there are changes that are made to that page. So that we'll call as the steel policy. There's a second component uh, the, that, that's a, a, a one dimension to this problem. And stealing is saying the buffer manager can take a page that is unpinned and flush it to disk even if it's dirty and the transaction that's dirty it hasn't committed yet. So we'll write uncommitted changes to the stable storage, and that's okay. All right? No steel is saying, no, no, I'm going to take away this power of replacement policy from you. Certain things besides pinned pages, you can't uh, steal pages for transactions that are running. And that's obviously going to give you a lot less flexibility. It'll be a poorer performing system. The second dimension to steal, no steal, is the force policy, which is at the commit time, what do I do? At the commit time, if I say, all the changes that were made by the transaction that is committing must be forced into disk before committing, then I'll get durability, but it'll be very expensive because imagine I'm a transaction that's touching one byte in 100 byte records for a billion records. I'm just changing one billion bytes, but I've touched everything and I have to bring everything into memory, update all of that stuff, and then write all of that stuff at commit time. Okay, so that will be a lot of changes that have to be flushed at commit time, and you have a slow system, but, but that could be how you, how you could work in that case. So force says at commit time, I will force the committed transaction changes to disk. No force says, no, 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 don't force that. Find a better way to do the commit that is more efficient, and then deal with bad things that can happen in a different way, which is where logging is going to come in. Okay? So let's look at one of the simplest policies of these combinations of steel, no steel, force, no force. The easiest one is no steel. Buffer pool can do much. It can't steal a page. Uh, and force is you write stuff. So it's a combination that works, but it's obviously pretty slow. But let's see in that just an example as to what happens with this simple scheme, which is not realistic, right? We want to do better and we will. So you have a read of A, bring that page in. You've seen this page multiple times now. You go right to that. Second transaction comes in makes its right, and force means I will now force the changes of this page to disk, but because 
I have changes to A that was made by T1, which is not done. If I'm doing a force policy, I'm still going to need to figure out what's the older version of this page. I need some mechanism to go keep track of that and then only flush that out to disk. Okay? So just want you to know, even if it's a simple list scheme that you can think of, you're going to have a little complication. But we'll do much better than that. This is just an example. No one implements it like that because this will still be a very slow system. Okay? But there's no free lunch. Even with the simplest combination, you still have complications. All right. So easiest scheme to implement. Uh, it has a couple other problems with it. One is if the number of objects that I'm writing to, imagine you have a buffer pool with a million pages and you want to update in a transaction, a table that then you want to update a field for all the records in a table, and that table has a million plus one pages, you can't do this. Because according to no steel force policy, every page has to be brought into memory and can't be pushed out till, because of the no steel part, can be pushed out to disk till the transaction is done. So this is just to say that the no steel part can be really problematic. The force part is not trivial too, because you have to go figure out which part of that page changed. So we need to ultimately live in a world where we have to try to make the opposite of this happens, which is to have the most high performance scheme, which is to do steel no force. Now, as we start to make changes, we'll have to keep track of what we have changed and uh, work with that. So one of the options that we will have to do and this is running out of battery for some reason, even though I've got this plugged in. So hold on before everything dies out here. Maybe this, this thing is broken here. Jeez. Not good. It's saying I'm going to shut you down in a minute. But. Yeah, it should power through it. Otherwise, I'm going to have to take a little time and this is serious. So hold on. There we go. Now I have to switch this guy out here and then set everything back up again. Give me a minute. Fun. That gives you a little bit of downtime to think about all this stuff. So less stuff for the final. I have half a mind to record a 20 minute uh, lecture and make it part of it, but you guys will kill me. So I won't do that. I won't do that. But I was thinking ways to get out of this. Sorry? No, 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 I'm nearly there. I've, I'm fighting here, guys, for every minute. Thanks for all the help. Okay, I think we are back. Let's make sure. Uh, oh, good. Now, this thing, today this connector to the external monitor is very finicky. It seems to not want to do that. Okay, there we go. I think we are back in business. And hopefully the lecture is still recording. Otherwise, I'll record it at home and add extra material for the exam. No, I'm just kidding. Won't do that. All right. So we still have to record what we need to unwind from or make sure it made it to disk. There are two techniques. One is shadow paging. It's a bad idea. No one does it. This was the first thing that people did when they realized they need recovery protocol. So I'll describe it, but I'm going to skip through the slides that are in there uh, over here, and I will refer you to uh, the deck if you needed to go look at. What shadow paging? So remember, we ran into this trouble where two transactions, the changes were on the same page, and we had to worry about that. There's a bigger version of this problem where I've got a bunch of changes that I'm making and shadow paging. Effectively, what we need is we need to keep track of a before and after version of the changes we are making. Okay, One way to do that is to keep track of uh, a scheme in which I have all the pages that I have on disk, and I'll keep track in memory something called a master page table, kind of like your operating system, those of you who have taken an operating system class know that there's a page mapping table from your virtual address space to a physical address space, right? Kind of like that, but not that complicated. Here is just saying uh, page one 
is this page, uh, uh, this disk position uh, in my stable storage. Okay, it's just a pointer. It's just a, a list of where the pages are. And when the transaction comes in, it will make a copy of that page table. Effectively think of it as getting a snapshot by virtue of copying this. And now when it makes changes, it's going to make changes if page one has to be updated. It'll make a new copy of that page, a shadow, make a full new copy of itself, of that page, make changes just there. So if some of the transaction is making changes to page one, it'll make another full copy of page one. Uh, and there are ways to merge it and combine that, but assume it just as one at a time. And then effectively, all the changes will create new pages. Those are only pointed to by my shadow page table copy. And then ultimately, when I'm ready to commit, I will do the following, which is I'll take the, there's a pointer in memory to the root of the master page table, which is pointing to the old page table. A copy of that is also kept on disk, right? Because that's the stable point when the disk, when the database system starts from scratch, it'll read that stuff because it knows kind of where everything is. And then I will go flush that out over there, then switch the pointer to the new shadow page. And now that becomes the master and eventually some background stuff goes clean things up. So this was the easiest implementation as you can imagine, someone who wanted to get this type of recovery protocol. No one does that. I guess th there are some systems who do that, but it's a bad idea. The better approach is what we are going to talk about with the write ahead logging protocol. Obviously massive problems, right? Huge fragmentation. Now you're doing this garbage collection at the page level and you'll make copies and copies of pages and stuff like that. So lots and lots of problems. We won't talk about that. But as I said here, you can look at last year's lecture on this, which spends about 10, 15 minutes on the next two slides, including this I would recommend just for learning purposes to go back and look at what SQLite used to do. They had the old scheme with shadow paging because they started in 2000. Uh, people hadn't advanced in all these protocols as much at that time, but then they switched over to write ahead logging, which we're going to talk about next, okay? And so it makes copies and copies, but it does copies in a slightly different way, but effectively the same kind. All right, this is what we need to pay attention to. Material for exam starts back again. We won't ask you questions on shadow paging, okay? Uh, write ahead log is the way you implement the Bay foundation for the recovery protocol. The idea is we want to make the steel no force, the opposite of the easiest scheme, the hardest scheme is steel no force work. And for that, we'll have to keep track of what changes are being made and use those changes in two different ways. So we'll create something called a log file. Don't confuse this with a log structured file system. I'll make a comment about that in a little bit. Quick uh, 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 preview of that is even a log structured file system for the mem table will do logging like this, the write ahead logging. Okay, so this is database logs and we'll keep that in a database log file which is a different file and the log records, we are going to create log records and they'll get created in the buffer pool in pages that will eventually get flushed out to the log file. Okay, so there's a separate file called the log file. Okay, and it'll go through the buffer pool too. And usually there's a separate place in the buffer pool for buffering log pages. So you can think of a design space as having these two dimensions, force, yes, no, at transaction commit time do a force, the changes to disk, or how flexible is the buffer pool? Does, is it allowed to steal pages? We want that because that makes it more efficient or not allowed to steal. And we already talked about the no steal force policy as being trivial. And what we want is that desired space. So no force steal policy on the force aspect basically says for every update, flush the updated page to disk. And this means Transactions are durable. Committed transactions changes are on disk. So for committed transaction, you can say, I've met the D property for you, okay? But it'll be poor response time because you have to flush a lot of pages to disk for transactions that update a lot. The steel policy and the force plus no steel is the easiest combination, right? But all no steel policies, what they will say is the buffer manager cannot take a page away for a transaction that is still working and that works for aborted transaction because their changes never make it to disk, right? But uh, it will be a low throughput because very soon the buffer manager has very few degrees of freedom to take pages and uh, do the replacement policy. So we really want the no force and steel policy. What's the complication with the no force? 
So remember, in no force, our concern is that at commit time, I'm not requiring the dirty pages be flushed to disk. We let the LRU timestamp dictate that when a page is, a page is written out. But what happens if a page crashes before its changes make it to disk? The example we started out with Putin zapping up the page, like we have to go deal with that. So what we'll do is we'll write these things called logs, which are essentially diffs of changes that we made. And we'll use that at recovery protocol time, next lecture, to redo the changes that should have been in the stable storage in the first place. So we need, to, we need logs to redo changes that we should do. The steal policy, we want stealing allowed. And this is like 2023. So probably if all of these techniques were invented now, we'd probably not call it steal and force. But you know, those are non-PC times when these terms were invented. So, so pardon that. But we'll stay with the terms that are in the literature. So with the steal policy, our concern is that a page that was stolen and flushed to disk may have changes that were made by an uncommitted transaction. Now we need to undo that. So we're going to need logging to allow us to undo that. So logging is going to be used. Logging must have enough information to allow us to redo and undo. And the recovery protocol that we'll talk about in the next class will decide whether, when it reads a log record, whether it has to redo or undo. But along with that, there's another fundamental protocol that we need. And that is called write ahead logging. And the two very foundational pieces that you need in databases, one is this notion of two-phase locking, because from that you got the dependence graph of which everything is based for you to understand how to get isolation. The other piece is write ahead logging, which is the protocol that says, what, at what point can I declare a transaction status to be committed or aborted? Uh, there's a magical moment in the protocol where you say, at the point where X happens, that X is going to be when the commit log, product, commit log hits disk, uh, the transaction changes its status from active to committed. It has to be one very finite boundary, and that magical moment is determined by this write ahead logging protocol. And what that says is that the database system is going uh, to log records. This stays in volatile storage, and all records updated to a page are stay in this non volatile buffer pool, log buffer pool storage. But before I write a page to stable storage, I must make sure its log is written before I can write the page. That's the uh, right head logging protocol says that way I have the log information to undo and redo. Right? So before I can write the page and overwrite it in stable storage, all of its log must hit the disk. And without that, all of the stuff that we'll talk about will fail. So right head logging protocol says this is the way you're going to get that log information. And intuitively, it makes sense, right? I, if I wrote the page and then crashed before the log hit it, I don't know how to redo and undo the things that I may need to. Okay, So record your changes. Record, take that record of changes, put it in someplace safe that is stable before you can make the page, the, the changes uh, uh, pushed out to stable storage. Yes, log with. So there are two things happening. I've got a table in which I'm making changes, a bunch of tables in the database. All of those changes we're going to record in a log that is sitting in the buffer pool because we also don't want the log to be written to disk every time that's slow. But in that buffer pool, we'll flush the buffer pool, the logs portion of the buffer pool to disk. So if I'm page 13 and the buffer manager says, I want to evict page 13. First, it will say to the log manager, which is managing the log buffer pool, different buffer pool, right? May come from the same memory space, but it's a different manager. And say, hey, log manager, flush all your logs for page 13 and tell me when you're done. The log manager will flush it to the log file. And it'll, all the writes to this log file are going to be sequential. And then basically come back. And now the buffer manager can go and evict page 13. OK? So. so yeah, we'll see the logs, the structure of that log. So that's coming. What's in the logs and what that looks like is coming. OK? But basically, just think about it that way. When a buffer pool, a dirty page, only on a dirty page, if it's a clean page, you don't have to talk to the log manager, you as the buffer, man buffer pool manager. But the buffer pool manager on evicting a dirty page has to first tell the log manager, please flush everything, because the right-head protocol requires you to do that before you can do anything else.
I'm supposed to say a uh, updated page to already to the stable storage, then to the second paragraph. All, all records pertaining to an updated page are written to non-volatile storage. So it's non-volatile. Non-volatile non is stable. Yeah. Oh, it's the disk and SSDs. Yeah, I know. The textbook says non-volatile. Previously, people used to call it stable. Before that, they used to call it disk. So terms are changing like every few years because the storage hierarchy is changing. Yeah. So non-volatile is the good stuff that will not get zapped. Okay. All right. So the slide is correct. Great. So. Besides this, we're going to do a couple more things. We're going to write a special type of a log record called a begin log record. And when a transaction finishes with a commit status, we'll write a commit log record. There's also an abort log record. We'll see that in the next class. And then again, this says before I commit the transaction, this magical moment for a commit, write help protocol has two components. One is eviction of a dirty page. Please flush your logs before you flush the page. And the other thing it says, when you commit a transaction, that commit log record must be created, written in the log uh, 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 buffer pool, and that log page must be flushed to disk into this non-volatile storage. When you get the signal back that the page has been written correctly, that's the magical moment when the commit happens. And now you can tell the world the transaction is committed. So right here, logging protocol will have those two components. Dirty pages, essentially it says, the when a log of the change you're trying to make hits stable storage, at that point, we can declare that we now have a mechanism to unwind ourselves out from any changes that we need to move out to or reapply changes as we need to because logs will have the redo and undo information. OK? All right. Questions? I want to make sure I get this part because this is the foundation for understanding everything today and the rest of the next lecture. The begin record is, is just to say this is the mark of it. And you'll see when we get to checkpointing, it will help us figure out what's the boundary of that. Otherwise, if you have to scan a big log file, the log file can have millions of billions of records. You'll say, where did transaction T1 start? You have to scan everything. This tells you, oh, I don't need to go any further if I'm worried about transaction T1. So you want that. All right. So what's in this log records? I'm going to simplify it at a big uh, dramatic level. There's a whole set of papers on what to put in the log records, but they'll all pretty much have this in the different type of log records too, besides begin, commit, and the ones I'm telling you. Again, we are going to ignore that. There's a big fat textbook that can come that Jim Gray wrote uh, on all the details you'd ever want to know about transactions and logging. Borrow it from me if you're interested in that. For this course, we are going to uh, assume logs have this common structure, They'll record which transaction do I belong to? What object am I logging? Record. And we're just going to assume it's record level for this class. And then what type of information am I logging? Is it something that I use for undo or for redo? And obviously, the undo stuff, which means give me my old value, is something you wouldn't do if you're working with an MVCC-based storage system. OK? So little connection across that. But rest of it, again, we are going to work with a single version system to keep all the PowerPoints uh, sensible. So right ahead logging example, start with the transaction. Now, as you can see, the buffer pool has a buffer pool for your pages and a little additional thing called the right ahead uh, buffer. So it's a buffer pool like your page oriented buffer pool, probably much smaller. Uh, and it's things from that get evicted from top to end. It's a, the log, as you'll see, is a linear sequence of log records. They're ordered. And so effectively, the right ahead buffer pool is typically pretty small. It might just have a small number of pages. So you need at least two, but it might have a few hundred. And everything's going to get flushed from top to bottom. And that will become more clear when we talk about the recovery protocol in the next class. OK, so it's a sequential file, a little bit different than the other files, but it has a buffer pool so that when log records are created, they get created in the buffer pool. So transaction T1 started, has a begin. Now T1 is getting written. So that transaction is recording your old value was one, new value is eight. Uh, sorry, uh, old value is eight, new value is one. And so that's why that record has T, A, one, and eight, because eight was the old value. So now in the log record, I'm keeping track of my old and new value. OK, and you can, as we just talked about, you can optimize that stuff if you are in MVCC. Uh, and now B got written. Again, I've got old and new value. When I write, when a transaction is ready to commit, even though that 
log buffer pool page is not full for that right ahead blog file, I will flush that half full page to disk before I can declare comment. When that page comes back with a, OK, the page was written, the transaction is declared committed. OK, now obviously this scheme at commit time, we've optimized a lot of things. If this transaction were touching a million objects, then it may have just created, if it were touching just one byte in the million objects, it may have just created a few log pages as opposed to having to write million data pages to disk. That's why you can see why this is faster. But <coughs> it's still slow because at commit time, I still have to wait for that disk I/O to come back. And those are, as you know, many tens of milliseconds, right? Uh, <coughs> and so even though it is safe, this can be slow. <coughs> And if the now at that commit time, if the buffer pool gets zapped out, the DRAM gets zapped out, which means I've lost both buffer pool, I can reconstruct from that log file. But it's still slow because for each commit, I have to wait for the disk to finish. Now imagine I've got 100 transactions running. They all are ready to commit. I will, the first transaction will commit, wait for that page to come back. The other transaction cannot come in till the page comes back. So now you're blocking transactions from tens of milliseconds, which is an eternity. You still have a pretty slow system, much better than the no steel force uh, policy that we had, but can we make it better? So most systems for high performance will do something called group commit. It's a very simple idea is that I'm going to batch up the commits that are coming together. I'm going to pick an interval like five milliseconds or something like that. It's pretty common. And even though a transaction is ready to commit, like T1 comes in, creates its stuff in the uh, buffer pool here. It's in the right ahead buffer pool. Now I'm not showing the data buffer pool, right? Remainder of this uh, class will only care about the right ahead log buffer pool, okay? Or the log manager's buffer pool. This comes in, starts to go, and uh, that page gets flushed to disk, and that's fine because maybe we need that page. We start writing to that new page, and one of the transactions is ready to commit. As you can see, the other, other transaction is going to commit very shortly. We don't know that, but with the group commit, what you'll do is you'll say, I as a transaction and ready to commit, but you know what? I'm going to hold off for five milliseconds, whatever is the timeout, and wait for anyone else who wants to write a commit log record to everything that's in the log buffer pool. Okay? And then every five milliseconds, I'm going to take everyone that is waiting to be committed because they've declared, I've thrown my commit flag, Tell me when I'm done. You collect all of their log records, and then you'll flush that out to disk. And so effectively, when you write that page, everything that you've written, all the transactions that were ready to commit, they'll wait an average of if 5 milliseconds is your timeout interval. They'll wait an average of 2.5 milliseconds. But what you'll get is a very a much higher throughput system, though you've added late, a little bit of latency to each transaction, on average 2.5 in this case, but the throughput of the system will be much higher because one disk I/O will commit a whole bunch of transactions. If lots of transaction systems are active, maybe you got 100 transactions that were ready to commit in that five millisecond period. So you'll get a much higher throughput system than you have. So pretty much everyone does some form of group commit to do that. Some might even play around with a little bit of tricks like, oh, that uh, I won't even wait. They will go even further. They'll say, I will write this out to disk. I've initiated the disk I/O. I won't even wait for the I.O. to come back and tell you it's committed. And you can read the manuals, and sometimes you'll see that in all the database vendors. Like, oh, you could set it up that way, which means it's like, what's your tolerance to that failure in that short amount of time while that I.O. happens? OK, there are options like that you will see. A couple more slides, and then I promise I will stop. The logging schemes are, I want to finish the logging schemes, and then we'll stop. Uh, there are three different types of logging schemes. Let's just go through that. The first one is physical logging, which is to say at the what I'm going to record is effectively like a git diff. I'm going to record in the log the before and after image of what was changed. Now, usually that is done uh, at the value level. But as you can imagine, this diff can start to become really large. Now, the challenge with this scheme is that if I'm doing this, imagine I've got a page, and that page is a slotted page structure, and records have records can move around in a slotted page structure while still keeping the slot ID, right? You might have compaction happening inside the page, for example. This before this physical logging 
where I'm keeping before and after images might record changes at the page level of stuff that is not even changed by this transaction because it was just the before and after images uh, 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 might have physically, it's just physically looking at the bytes that have been changed on the page before and after and might get a whole bunch of stuff that is irrelevant to the actual changes, which is a cue to the physiological logging that is coming next. There's the other extreme, which is to say logical logging. I'm just going to record the data function that caused this value to change. In a very simple form, it is recording the query. More often, it's going to be, I incremented the value by 10, right? If that was an update like that, if the update query said A plus 10, this would actually record, it's a, I'm an increment function, and my parameter was 10 to this record. So it will logically record what was, what was changed. Uh, uh, or it might say, I updated 10 for everything that uh, has a predicate of B greater than 10. Effectively take whatever is in the query, find some representation for that, and represent that in the logical structure, in the log. Now, you can get a much more compact log uh, a record, but when you have to go and apply these changes, you have to actually go run that query again to redo it. And if that query took an hour to run, while applying the log, you're going to have to take an hour to run. And so that could be very expensive. So people don't do logical logging. What people do is this physiological logging, which basically, going back to the previous slide, is it's physical to a page. So at the page level, you'll keep track of the uh, 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 before and after images. But uh, 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 it's for every page that you change, you're going to create a log record. But within the page, you'll just say what was the update made. So you, if the records got moved around, you won't have that. The downside is that a given operation log record might now generate multiple log records. So if something changed, uh, 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 an update to a record might have involved, or update to in a transaction might have involved changes to multiple pages. You'll have one log record per page. The bottom line is there are different logging schemes, and what we will use this logging schemes is to do the redo and undo, and we'll pick up on that in the next class. This shit is gangsta. Gangsta. That boy's a gangsta. You ain't nothing but a gangsta. Yeah, yeah. Now listen, I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 is send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. I ain't lying for that cake, your fam, I see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great.